introduce our next session, which will be run by Council of the Americas Chairman Andres Gluski. We are pleased to welcome the head of International Government Affairs for Shell, a presenting platinum sponsor, Amy Conroy. Amy. Good morning. It is my great pleasure to welcome Andres Gluski, Chairman of the Council of the Americas, and to introduce our next speaker, the Honorable David Turk, Deputy Secretary of the United States Department of Energy. David is the absolute perfect speaker to discuss the energy transition in the Western Hemisphere. Among his many roles, he has served at the State Department as Deputy Special Envoy for Climate Change, as a Senior Director at the National Security Council, and at the International Energy Agency as Deputy Executive Director. He clearly has dedicated his career to helping solve the world's energy challenges. His expertise on national security issues, as well as on climate and clean energy issues, uniquely positions him to advise not only the US government, but governments around the world on maintaining energy security while racing to address climate challenges. As we look to the role the Western Hemisphere can play in this meaningful and complex transition, the focus on maintaining and expanding a mix of energy sources, stewarding our natural resources, concentrating our attention on climate change, all the while ensuring that our citizens in the Western Hemisphere have the energy that will allow them to thrive will not be easy. The policy challenges that our governments face as they juggle these priorities are enormous, and we know that getting it right will require all stakeholders, including governments, the private sector, and civil society to work together. Deputy Secretary Turk, thank you for being with us today. I can think of no one better to help, under, to help us understand the challenges and the opportunities going forward. So I hope you enjoy this interview. Well, David, thank you very much for being here. Um, I noticed on your CV we share something. You are an alumni of the University of Virginia Law School. I got my doctorate there. So it's unusual to have two UVA grads uh, at an international conference. Um, as uh, Amy said, uh, we really couldn't have a better speaker uh, to talk about the energy transformation uh, in Latin America, or well, actually in the whole Western Hemisphere. And what role can Latin America play together with the United States in this global transformation? Uh, you were just visiting Brazil, uh, Argentina, Chile, and I'm sure you saw many great opportunities, many great challenges in the region. So perhaps you could share your experiences, your impressions of this trip. Well, let me uh, first start, Andres. Thank you for taking the time, and uh, as a fellow UVA I graduate, <laughs> Uh, to do this discussion with you. Thank you, Amy, for the very kind introduction. And uh, thank you to Eric and all our council colleagues for putting on this terrific event. It's an absolute pleasure to be with uh, you all. And uh, any excuse I get, and doesn't take an excuse, but any opportunity that I have to work on uh, Western Hemisphere issues and Latin American issues in particular, uh, it's not only because uh, Latin America is so important for energy and needs to be such a critical piece of the clean energy future, but I happen to be born in Ecuador, lived in Chile and Brazil as a kid, and um, really enjoy working on these issues and uh, a true partnership that this administration really wants to work uh, on these issues in particular. So from my visit, I was just down there a couple weeks ago. I had a chance to go to a few places in Brazil and then Argentina and Chile as well. And what I came away with, uh, first and foremost, is uh, Latin America, and obviously different countries in Latin America have different attributes and different um, opportunities, but um, overall, Latin America is a clean energy powerhouse. And uh, I think there is a huge, huge additional opportunity for Latin America to do even more in the clean energy space in a way that works first and foremost for the people in these countries, the people in Latin America, but the way that works for accelerating our clean energy transition that we need to have here in the hemisphere and in the world as well. So I know there's challenges, happy to get into some of those challenges. But overall, I took a sense of real opportunity and commitment, both from the government side and certainly from the private sector side as well. So uh, one of the things that uh, Latin America has in abundance, and you're right, it's a clean energy powerhouse. 
Latin America actually has one of the greenest energy sectors in the world. Actually, South America in particular, because they have so much hydro. But there's tremendous solar resources. There's also tremendous wind uh, resources in the area. But it's also blessed with some of the critical minerals mm. for the energy transition. So if there's anything I'm willing to take a bet on is that the energy transition will need copper, for example. Uh, and you have some of the biggest copper producers in the world in the region. Lithium is becoming increasingly uh, important. And it also holds the biggest reserves of lithium uh, in the continent, oh, sorry, in the, in the world. So how do you see sort of Latin America's role in terms of producing uh, these critical minerals? Uh, and there's another one that I, you're an expert in. It, it really has to do with green hydrogen. Because one of the things of green hydrogen, producing green hydrogen with renewables, is that it requires a lot of space, a lot of solar farms, a lot of wind. Uh, but it would be, it's an interesting case where this could become actually a tradable good. Because electricity is not a tradable good, uh, generally. I mean, you have a transmission line. But, so this is maybe a way to tap that enormous potential that Latin America has. So it's, it has the critical minerals. It has the ability to produce a lot of green energy. And can that green energy be producing green hydrogen? Well, this is why I really leaned in on the uh, even uh, bigger opportunity space going forward. And um, it is true there's a lot of hydropower, but it is also solar, it's wind, including offshore mm -hmm. wind. Really impressed in Brazil with Petrobras and some opportunities for offshore wind in the Brazilian context, but other uh, countries uh, as well on that front. And when you think about um, energy assets and energy resources, good for the population, good for business, mm -hmm. and good for the hemisphere, and good for the world, Boy, critical minerals and uh, hydrogen, especially a global trade in hydrogen, clean hydrogen, is a huge, huge opportunity uh, space. So certainly in Brazil, in Chile, in Argentina, but there are other countries as well who have a range of resources, a range of critical minerals. And uh, I'm a firm believer that those minerals uh, should first and foremost benefit the people uh, in those countries. Uh, but they can also benefit the acceleration and the appetite that there is and will be even further uh, throughout the world for these critical minerals. Uh, the estimates here are just uh, immense in terms of the uh, volume that we're gonna need, the reliable, secure, diverse supply chains that we're gonna need. The part that I was particularly excited on the critical minerals piece, and this is gonna require an awful lot of true partnership, public and private, but also the US government with other governments working with these uh, governments and the uh, duly elected uh, folks in these countries, is can we move up the supply chains? So can this not just be a, let's extract mineral from country X or country Y, can we move up that supply chain in a way that I think uh, uh, helps the economic development, the opportunities for these countries and communities in these countries, uh, but also helps diversify those supply chains in a way that uh, makes sense from our own national security, our enduring national security from the US uh, and other countries as well thinking on that. So that's not to say it's easy, that's not to say that's not a lot of uh, efforts that's gonna be necessary from the government side, from the private sector side, but I think there's a huge, huge opportunity space on the critical minerals uh, piece. And on the hydrogen part, uh, because the grid in many of these countries, Brazil is a great example, uh, is already very decarbonized, as they have additional opportunities, whether it's solar, whether it's onshore wind, whether it's offshore wind, um, the estimates of their comparative advantage for green hydrogen production um, is really uh, just tremendous. That is a huge, huge opportunity. And there is an appetite for green hydrogen in Europe, in the US, and other countries around the world. And I think there will be an increasing appetite as companies, as countries get serious, even more serious about decarbonizing their entire economies. We've got these net zero commitments. We certainly have one in the US that I'm incredibly proud that I work for an administration that has a net zero commitment by 2050. That means we need to de decarbonize all sectors of our economy, including those that are more challenging. So if you think of uh, decarbonizing a number of industrial capabilities, heavy duty transport, uh, aviation fuels, uh, hydrogen becomes an attractive opportunity space, not only for countries domestically, but for export opportunities. And there's a lot that needs to happen to get that global market up and running but there is a huge opportunity space. And in each of the countries I visited, and I know there are other countries as well in Latin America, I think they're situated incredibly well, but we need to execute, we need to work in that true partnership uh, form. Yeah, you brought up something uh, very important that's really not covered much, I think, in sort of mass media. In the energy transition, 
you can build renewables, right? Wind and solar, but they're intermittent. And, and the problem is that, what does that mean? Well, sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always blow. So how do you get 24 seven energy? Because that's really what, mm -hmm. you know, the, uh, the countries need, the industries need. And so that comes to how can you get that capacity, you know, basically the ability to fill in the gaps when the renewables is not available. How do you get it zero carbon? And so th there are really, I'd say three ways. You know, one is a nuclear that they can fill in those blanks. Uh, second is, is a hydro with a dam that you can fill, run it when the renewables aren't running. And the other one is really energy storage. And right now the most promising and, and the most ubiquitous uh, technology is lithium ion batteries. And again, the biggest deposits in the world are Argentina, Bolivia, and Chile. And Chile, I think, is probably the biggest exporter of lithium in the world. It's right there um, with Australia. But when you mention, like, for example, producing green hydrogen, one of the keys is running your electrolyzers, you know, splitting water atoms into hydrogen uh, and oxygen on a more continuous basis. So Latin America, having a green grid, having that hydropower, can do that. But it also has the space to put a, a lot of renewables that then you can store up with batteries. So I think that's a, it's a critical piece that I think a lot of times people don't cover. And that's a, you know, you need big countries to be able to do this, mm -hmm. you know. And in the hemisphere, we, we have a lot of space for that. So I, I think that could make Latin America an, an important um, uh, producer of, of green hydrogen and synthetic fuels for that. Uh, but you're gonna need a lot of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. You're gonna need specialized boats, you're gonna need specialized ports, uh, storage facilities. H how do you see that sort of uh, evolving? Because you'll, you'll also need them in the States. Yeah, so this is, this is where I think there's a real true, op uh, true partnership opportunity, not only with the US government, but with industry in a public-private way in Latin America. So for the hydrogen economy, the clean hydrogen economy to take off, and we've got a lot of hydrogen in the system more generally. It's just produced by natural gas and some from coal. Uh, but you don't get the carbon benefits, the decarbonization benefits uh, from it. Uh, one, we've got to reduce costs. So we still have to reduce costs on the electrolyzer front. And we're spending a lot of money in the U.S. government. Others are spending a lot of money. Uh, we're actually spending $9.5 billion uh, on a variety of hydrogen efforts here in the U.S. domestically. And that doesn't even count for the tax credit that we're also working on with IRS and Treasury to have a significant amount, up to $3 per kilogram, tax credit. So you put $3 per kilogram tax credit production on hydrogen, 9.5 billion, including a significant amount of that to drive down electrolyzer costs, $8 billion of that to do hydrogen hubs in our country, which is a, uh, a good way to get hydrogen, clean hydrogen in the system at scale, including the infrastructure piece. As we do that at scale, as Europe does it at scale, as Japan focuses on hydrogen, as other countries around the world focus on hydrogen, I think you're gonna get those cost reductions. You're gonna get a lot of lessons learned, including the system-wide lessons learned on that front. It is gonna require uh, a lot of investment in infrastructure uh, in countries, including in Latin America, to uh, take where you're producing that hydrogen from solar, from wind, uh, other uh, ways you can produce hydrogen and get it to where you need to get it from. You also need to get the international uh, trade mechanisms, both the standards piece, but also the actual mechanics of how that works. And I know there's some skepticism out, out there. What I'd say on that front is, uh, look how far we've come along on the natural gas LNG side of things in terms of the cost reductions and having a global market, increasingly global market on that front. Uh, one could envision, we're gonna need to do a lot of work, there's gonna need to lead a lot of true partnership here. One could envision a global marketplace for hydrogen developing and maybe quicker than a lot of people think. Um, and that is a huge, huge opportunity for all the reasons you mentioned, Andres, uh, for these countries, for many countries in Latin America. Yeah, I, th I think in the, that's, uh, you mentioned some very important things. I think it's important to have a standard, uh, common standard, what is green hydrogen, you know, around the world, so it becomes a tradable good. Mm -hmm. And you uh, raise the issue of uh, LNG, how that market developed. and. You know, quite frankly, how the U.S. has become a major exporter of LNG and how important that fuel is for the energy transition. Because another thing is, you know, you can't snap your fingers and go from fossil fuel-based uh, energy system to a renewable one. This is a transition. Uh, but the States has played a really key role in supplying, you know, not only its uh, friends and allies in Europe and in Asia, but also in Latin America in supplying uh, LNG to Latin America, which has been a uh, 
reliable uh, source in these, in these you know, very turbulent times. You mentioned you know, uh, elements of the Inflation Reduction Act. And I think that um, this is a very important policy towards really a commitment by part of the United States to be a leader in, in addressing global climate change. So maybe a little bit, you've, I think you've mentioned how the U.S. can help drive down the costs of it. Um, how other ways do you think sort of the Inflation Reduction Act can help the Western Hemisphere in its, uh, achieve its, its transformation to a green uh, energy system? So I think useful to take a step back, and I know those of us who are involved in these issues day to day sometimes lose sight of uh, the forest for the trees, but um, to reflect on what has happened legislatively here in this country over the last couple of years. And it's the Inflation Reduction Act. There was another important piece of legislation called the Bipartisan Infrastructure Legislation uh, and some other efforts as well. So uh, what the IRA and these other bills have done uh, is to enact the most transformative, the largest, the biggest impact climate clean energy legislation ever in the history of humanity. Not just in the history of the US, about tenfold, ten times bigger than anything we've done in the US, but the largest package of incentives and funding streams uh, ever in the history of humanity. So just to give you a sense of scale and what we're talking about, the tax incentives, which get an awful lot of attention, and rightfully so, we've got a couple hundred of our DOE folks working with Treasury and IRS to get these tax incentives up and the guidance out there on a whole range. A, the breadth of the tax incentives across the clean energy mm -hmm. landscape is just immense. Uh, most of these tax incentives are also 10 years. We've not had 10 year of certainty on tax incentives here in our country. We uh, basically have a year or two and then we've gone and had to get them extended. We've got that 10 year of certainty, mm -hmm. which is a huge amount. Uh, there are estimates that this is uh, 400 billion or so dollars. It could be even more than that. There's not a cap on the tax incentives. So if businesses, if others who are applicable or eligible for these tax credits apply and they qualify, it could be even uh, bigger than that. But it's not just the tax incentives. There's an awful lot of other levers, other tools in the tool belt. So just at my department, the Department of Energy, We've been given $100 billion, not given $100 billion. We've been entrusted with $100 billion on behalf of U.S. taxpayers. That's 70 uh, different new programs, mostly cost, comp cost competitions or competitive uh, uh, competitions that go out there for applicants, 50% cost share, 30% cost share. I mentioned the $8 billion in hydrogen hubs. There's an awful lot more money in cost competitive uh, applications out there. That is a huge volume. This is a big economy, this is a very dynamic economy. When we do things at scale in this country, just like other countries, when they do things at scale, uh, that's gonna reduce costs on these clean energy technologies like never uh, before. And so I think people are gonna be pleasantly surprised <laughs> at how much cheaper things are in the clean energy marketplace going forward. And when you reduce costs in one country, those cost reductions one way or another uh, filter out and uh, have a, um, a benefit globally in a way that I'm not sure people have internalized uh, yet along those lines. It's also true that a lot of companies that are working in the U.S., whether they're U.S. companies or Latin American companies or other companies, uh, also have significant assets and plans, uh, and uh, I don't need to tell you this, Andres, uh, have uh, huge opportunities elsewhere. And so if their bottom line, and they make a lot of money in the U.S. context, that helps their bottom line, that helps them lean in uh, in other countries as well. The third piece is the supply chain part. Uh, I think there's huge, huge supply chain opportunities, not just for solar PV, not just for batteries, but in a whole range of parts of the clean energy economy uh, that we're gonna need to have diversified supply chains. We're gonna need to have reliable supply chains uh, with countries uh, that are democracies and countries that have that political stability over a period of time. And when I look at all of those, I think there's huge, huge opportunities, direct and indirect, uh, for countries in uh, the whole Western Hemisphere and certainly in Latin America. Yes, we had the um, uh, ministers from Canada, from Costa Rica, um, and, and also talking that the supply chain, the U.S. will drive a supply chain becoming greener. And I think the benefits of the U.S. really leading the sort of technology innovation, which I think is key, because to get to a clean grid, we do need new technologies. You know, we can get very far, but to get that final step. Um, one thing that I'll just mention as a recovering economist, uh, that um, 
right now in Washington, there's a lot of talk about the deficit. We're all terrified about whether the debt ceiling limit <laughs> will be, how, how painful that process will be. Uh, but all deficits were not created equal. Uh, if you have a deficit because you're doing it in infrastructure investment, and you have a dearth of infrastructure investment, that's very productive. It's very different from having a deficit current consumption. And we can take the example of Panama, where they even had a referendum to run a very large deficit to expand the canal. So that's a very different deficit than one you're just doing for current expenditures. So I think that um, hopefully you know, this will uh, continue. And I think that the US setting the example of, for example, giving 10 years security for investors in green energy is very important. And that's at a very important, there's been, this conference has been very uh, interesting because it's almost been like an energy conference this morning, you know, given how central uh, the topic has become. And, and one of the topics that came out is the importance of sort of having certainty of reducing the risks to promote private investment. So I think that, you know, this is an example for the US because for those who don't know, we used to have energy credits that were renovated on a yearly or bi-yearly basis. So you're making investments for a 40-year project, and you, know, you don't know, you think it's always been renewed, but you know, two years the tax credit runs out. So I guess the last point sort of to close is, you know, how can we foment these public-private partnerships you know, in the countries themselves, but also across borders? Because you know, this is really a, a global issue, and it's really a hemispheric issue that we're talking about. Yeah, so a few, few thoughts on that. Um, one, I think you're right to reference the uh, importance of infrastructure investment, and there is a significant role. I think there's a significant role for the government to play there, to have those kinds of investments that are important five years, 10 years, 15 years, and incredibly exciting to see the US uh, doing that, certainly in the clean energy landscape, but with transportation and other infrastructure more generally as well. That's one point. Two, I think it's incredibly exciting, and this gets at the public-private uh, partnership opportunity that we have in front of us. The fact that we've got government policy in the U.S. and other key countries uh, ramped up at uh, historic, unprecedented levels, I would say the levels we need to to certainly tackle a challenge like climate change, where we've got to work at a pace and scale. If we're going to decarbonize by 2050, we've got to get working at it. That's 27 years uh, from now that we've got to decarbonize across, uh, across the board. And I think what things, uh, what legislation and leadership like the IRA and the other pieces of legislation, what we're trying to do with the Department of Energy, is it allows uh, not only political leaders, but it allows uh, corporate leaders. And talking to our uh, colleagues in the audience uh, who are CEOs or leaders in their particular businesses, uh, many companies, many countries have put out on the table net zero commitments, right? 2050 in most cases and other cases are around there as well. What I think we have a shared opportunity, and this is going to require an awful lot of public-private partnership, is not just to have that as an aspirational goal, but to have that as an actual real goal that we can achieve. And uh, I know I've talked to so many different CEOs and others who are personally committed to doing their part because they have kids, they have grandkids, they want to leave a legacy of actually uh, achieving our climate goals, not just having a long-term target out there and forgetting about it, but actually executing on that. And it feels like we now have the tools in the tool belt, not all the tools we need, but an awful lot more than we had to actually um, reduce that dissonance, to reduce that conflict in people's own heads that they actually can achieve the goals that they've now uh, put on the table. But it's going to require, and I've mentioned this word a few times, a true partnership. It's going to require a real dialogue, a real discussion, a real comparing of the notes. Um, I'm uh, incredibly... Uh, I feel incredibly fortunate to be in a country where you can have that good feedback. You can have those real conversations. You can have criticism from companies about what the government's doing and saying, boy, you should do this with the tax credit, not with the tax credit on that front. If you really want us to go out there and uh, make a bunch of money and do good for the world, this is how you need to structure this, or this is how this piece of legislation. That feedback, that guidance, that back and forth is absolutely critical if we're going to succeed on this. And there is no succeeding at pace and scale without the private sector. That's just the way the U.S. economy works. That's how other market economies uh, work out there. But the U.S. government, other governments need to put guardrails in place, need to send those incentives, need to have those incentives 
out there for companies to, to, to do good and at the same time make a bunch of cash. And I think we've got that opportunity here in the clean energy transition and really looking forward to having that feedback, having that guidance, making sure that we're doing everything we can with what we've been given by Congress, given by U.S. taxpayers, and work on that true partnership with other countries, but other companies in the region as well. And I think there really is a win-win opportunity here. Well, certainly count me in as one of the CEOs who's worried about his grandkid <laughs> and also uh, wants to satisfy my shareholders. So uh, that uh, is, is music to my ears. Good. Well, David, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and, and your experience with us. Uh, and I think, uh, again, uh, keep doing what you're doing. I think it's important uh, not only for the U.S., for the hemisphere, but for the world. So thank right. you very much. Thank you all.